Fasting is a big question in the Bible uh, and among Christian circles today. I went to a, a medical school, uh, a holistic uh, osteopathic medical school for about three years. And they tried to talk me into being a vegetarian and I, uh, I did, I tried, but I'm American Indian, that didn't work very well with me. I have to eat a lot of protein. I really had very bad health for a short while. I didn't know why until I went to my other doctor. And he asked me, he said, um, what nationality are you, Jim? And I said, I'm an American Indian. He said, okay, what they eat? I said, well, buffalo and, and uh, things like that. Buffalo, some wild fruit and nuts and things. And he said, okay. Uh, he said, that's a lot of protein in it. He said, now I'm Anglo-Saxon. I can uh, nearly be a vegetarian, but I eat about four ounces to six ounces of meat a week because there's things in meat that you need. And he was a Seventh-day Adventist doctor, and they, most of them are very high-oriented uh, vegetarians. Well, <clears throat> they also did fasting. Fasting, uh, I knew of several people that fasted so long that they finally died, they could not recover from it. You have to be very careful when you fast. When you go without eating for so long, then you don't want to eat, basically. You have to reintroduce to it, introduce yourself to it. I had a colitis and diverticulitis and uh, ulcerated colitis and diverticulitis at the same time. and It was brought on by medic medicine that they had given me anti-inflammatories. And uh, I couldn't eat one time for over a year any solid food, and it was really difficult for me to start chewing food again. It really, my jaws were really sore. All of these things people always do in extremes, don't they? In moderation, do things most of the time. Now, the Bible talks about fasting. Jesus fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. We know that Paul fasted, and that many of the New Testament disciples fasted, fasted, uh, concentrating on the on God and fasting and praying. Now, today it wouldn't be anything wrong with you fasting. One thing about fasting, if you're healthy enough to do that, by the way, if you've got hypoglycemia, I would not. I'd be very careful with it, and especially also if you have diabetes, things like that. Fasting it gets your body under control. You concentrate on God and you get your body under control. Your body wants food. I used to go without eating uh, pretty often when I was out working here in Nevada and I would go uh, two days without eating any meals. I mean, I would put something in my mouth and go down the road and <clears throat> drink some juice or something. And I would keep on doing that, and I, Marilyn, she has gone on little trips with me to where I didn't eat for 12, 14, 16, 18 hours and things like that. And she said, what are we going to eat? Oh, here, eat this. <laughs> here's a sandwich, here's some a jerky, here's some peanuts or something, you know. Just keep going. I had my mind on what I was doing. Prayer and fasting is something very, very common in the Bible. They fasted for the presence of God. They fasted for God to hear their prayers. And we know that God hears our prayers when we pray in Jesus' name. Now, he says yes or no. We always get an answer to the prayers, yes or no, whatever. But now, getting back to, to Moses. Now, Moses had fasted for 40 days already. He went up on <clears throat> Mount Sinai. He uh, got the the commandments of God, God wrote them, he cut them out of stone, he wrote them on his, with his own hand, and then Moses came down, and he was so angry when he saw the sin of Israel, he threw the, threw the stones down and they, they were broken. So now all of that time, we don't know how long he was down there, 
but he didn't eat for 40 days. We have no record of him eating at all or drinking anything down there. And then he's back up on the mountain again for 40 days. That's 80 days plus without food or water. But God was sustaining him in a miraculous way. Now, if you want to fast today and, and ask God in prayer for something, I know a lot of people when they're when someone in their family is sick, they will fast and they will pray. Jesus told the Pharisees, he said, you fast and you do all this thing to be seen by other men. He said, if you're going to fast, do it quietly and secretly. Don't say, I'm fasting, I'm fasting, I'm fasting. Oh, I'm fasting. If you fast and pray, just pray and fast to yourself. As simple as that. Now let's go on to this story here. We're in the 34th chapter of the, of the book of Exodus. Now the Lord said to Moses, Cut out for yourself two stone tablets. Now Moses cuts the two stone tablets. He cuts them out. When something is written in stone, this is where it comes from. That's a, that is a uh, what we call an idiom or... A classical saying, written in stone, it means it's permanent. And the Lord said to Moses, Go cut for yourself two tablets of stone like the former ones, and I will write on the tablets the words that were on the former tablets which were shattered. Now, God cut the stones out before, and he wrote on the stones. This time, Moses is going to cut the stones out, and God is going to write on the stones. Now, if they ever find the Ark of the Covenant over there in uh, Jordan, in that cave where God uh, told uh, Jeremiah to go hide all this stuff, the tabernacle and everything in the second chapter of Second Maccabees, if they ever find it, these stones are written on by God's own hand, but they were carved out by Moses himself. Now, that's in the Ark of the Covenant, so they probably won't look in there and see it. But that's what's in that Ark of the Covenant, one of the, one of the things. So be ready by morning and come up to the mountain, to Mount Sinai, and present yourself to me on the top of the mountain. And no man is to come up with you and let any man be seen anywhere in the mountain, even the flocks and the herds may not graze in the front of the mountain. So we cut two stones and tablet like the formal ones. And Moses rose up early in the morning and went to Mount Sinai, and the Lord commanded him, and he took two stone tablets in his hands. We don't know how thick these were or anything. Uh, if you watch uh, a Cecil B. DeMille's movie with the Charlton Heston in it and all of that, we don't know what it looked like. That We don't know what they looked like, but they were tablets of stone, and they were written on by the hand of God. And the Lord descended in the cloud and stood there with him and called upon the name of the Lord. Then the Lord passed by in front of him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in loving kindness and truth. Now here is several titles of God. The Lord is one. The Lord God is another. And compassionate and and gracious and slow to anger. The word gracious or forgiving is another title. The man of loving kindness is Jesus, the pre-incarnate Christ. And abounding in loving kindness and truth. Who keeps loving kindness for thousands, who forgives iniquity and transgressions and sin, yet he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children, on the grandchildren, and the third and fourth generations. You see that in America today in the welfare generation. <clears throat> you see that just compounded over and over and over again. Welfare is very good for those that really need it. But we got people that live off of welfare. Girls that get out and get pregnant when they're 14, 15 years old and start it all over again. And their children doing the same things over and over again. We got the illegal aliens come up here and having babies as fast as they can have them, as young as they can have them. So they got an anchor baby and then they live off of the system, off 
the system, off the system. Not working, living off the system. And Moses made haste to bow low toward the earth and worship. And he said, If now I found favor in thy, your sight, O Lord, I pray, let the Lord go along in our midst and even through the people who are so often, and you pardon our iniquity and our sin and take us as your own possession. Then God, he said, Behold, I am going to make a bereath with you, a cutting with you, before all your people, and I perform miracles which you have not been produced in the earth, nor among any of the nations, and all the people among you, you live, will see the working of the Lord, for it is a fearful thing that I am going to perform with you. Be sure to observe, I am commanding you this day, behold, I am going to drive out the Amorites, before you and I am going to grab out the Canaanite and remember in Genesis the ninth chapter verses 24 25 26 God says that the, the Canaanite would be cursed because they were going to be a cursed people he knew what they were going to be and they were they were a very ungodly uh, licentious people full of disease and the Hittite and the Perizzite and the Hivite and the Jebusite Watch yourself, that you make no covenant with these inhabitants of the land in which you are going, lest I become a snare in your midst. I will come back and I will haunt you. But rather you are to tear down their altars, smash their sacred pillars, cut down their asherim, their groves. They told all these things, he said, I want you to go into the northern part, I want you to go in the southern part, I want you to go in the plains, I want you... These are all people. These people dwelt in different parts of the land of Canaan. But rather you're tied down their altars and cut down their sacred groves. This is where they had their uh, sexual orgies, basically. For you shall not worship any other god, for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous god. Lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, and they play the harlot with their gods and sacrifice to the guards, and some invite you to eat of his sacrifice. They always made feasts. Don't go eat food that was sacrificed to idols, he said. And you take some of the, and you shall not take some of the daughters for your sons, and his daughters play the harlot with their god, and cause your sons to play the harlot with their gods. Remember, Judah married a Canaanite. And he had three sons by that woman. She died, but boy, what a mess with those boys, where boys were evil. You shall make for yourselves no molten gods. You shall observe the feast of unleavened bread for seven days. You are to eat unleavened bread, as I commanded you at the appointed time of the month of Aviv. For in the month of Aviv you came out of Egypt. And the first offering, our offspring, that is, from every womb belongs to me. That, by the way, this is a type of Christ, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And all your male livestock and the first offering from the cattle and the sheep. Now, <clears throat> what God is telling them to do, you got to trust me. You have a, you, you got a, 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 a ewe lamb, and she's pregnant, and she gives birth. You got to sacrifice that that child, that mm -hmm. lamb. And they said, well, maybe she won't have any more. Maybe she'll get killed. This is all I'm going to have. You've got to trust God to provide for you. The first offspring from every woman belongs to me and all your male livestock and the first offspring from the cattle and the sheep. And you shall redeem with a lamb the first offspring from a donkey. If you do not redeem it, then you shall break its neck. It's mine. Now, a donkey, by the way, is a beast of burden, and it is one of the greatest. The donkeys over there in Asia and uh, in the Middle East like that, they are fantastic little burdens, beasts of burdens. They're wonderful. 
The wild donkeys out here in Nevada, <laughs> they're, they're a different species. They're a different kind. Some of them are, you can tame, but they never are like those over there. You shall dream all the firstborn of your sons, and none shall appear before me empty-handed. You shall not come before me empty-handed. You shall respect me. You shall work six days, but on the seventh days you shall rest. Even during plowing time and harvest you shall rest. Don't be greedy. Don't push your servants. Don't push your animals. The animals have a day of rest also. The servants have a day of rest also. A lot of these people, if they, if they could have, they'd have had slaves that worked, worked on the Sabbath. But God said, don't do it. It's their Sabbath too. I'm going to take care of them. I'm going to take care of your animals. They're going to rest. And you shall celebrate the Feast of Weeks, that is, the first weeks of the wheat harvest and the Feast of then gathering and the turn of the year. Three times a year all your male shall before me, the Lord God, the God of Israel, again, the Lord God, the God of Israel, the Lord Jehovah, the God of Israel. Jehovah means he who shall become. This is the pre-incarnate Christ. For I will drive out nations before you, and enlarge your borders, and no man shall covet your land when you go up three, three times a year to appear before the Lord your God. I'm going to make you a fearsome people, and nobody's going to even come in here. They're going to stay away from you because they know I'm your God. If you serve me, this is a conditional covenant, people. If you serve me. You shall not offer the blood of my sacrifice with leavened bread. Nor is the sacrifice of the feast of the Passover to be left until morning. Everything's holy. If it's left until the morning, it's got to be burned. You shall bring the first of the first fruits of your soul into the house of your Lord God, your God. First fruits of your soil. That means uh, pomegranates, grapes, wheat, barley, whatever. You shall not boil a kid in his mother's milk. And this is what the Jewish people today won't give you milk and, and meat at the same meal. It's not talking about that. The pagans boiled a little calf in its mother's milk or a goat or a lamb. They boiled it in its mother's milk and pagan sacrifices. Don't do that, he said. I don't want you acting like them. I want you to be separate. I want you to not act them like them. Don't act like the heathen. Then the Lord said to Moses, write down these words, for in accordance with these words, I have made a covenant with you and with Israel. So, he was there with the Lord forty days and forty nights, and he did not eat bread or drink water. And he wrote the tablets of the words of the covenant and the Ten Commandments. And it came about when Moses was coming up from the Mount Sinai, and the two tablets of the testimony were in Moses' hand as he was coming down the mountain, that Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because he was speaking with God. God's presence shone on Moses. He shined. He was reflecting the glory of God. So when Aaron and all the sons of Israel saw Moses, behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come near him. Then Moses called to them, and Aaron and all the rulers of the congregation returned to him, and Moses spoke to them. And afterward all the sons of Israel came there, and he commanded them to do everything that the Lord had spoken to him on Mount Sinai. Now there's about 3,000 less of them, remember? A bunch of them got killed the last time he came down off that mountain. And when Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil over his face. But whenever Moses went in before the Lord and speak with him, he would take the veil until he came out. And whenever he came out and spoke to the sons of Israel what he had been commanded, the sons of Israel would see the face of Moses and that the skin of Moses' face shone. So Moses would replace the veil over his face until he went in to speak with him again. Many times, have you ever seen a preacher that the absolute word of God just flowed out of his out of his mouth and like 
like honey dripping off the end of your fingers, as Brother Hoyt Chastain used to say. He said, saturate yourself with the Word of God until it just drips off of the end of your fingers without you even knowing it. Study the Word of God. Saturate yourself with the Word of God. Moses was in the presence of God. When you study God's Word, you're in the presence of God. When you speak God's Word, you're bringing the presence of God to others. My Father, we send this message out. Thank you for your Word. Thank you for your shining glory in it. Use it wherever it goes in the world and glorify yourself with it and your Son. Please forgive me where I fail you. And I pray for all of my students out there everywhere that need in health problems and in spiritual problems. I just pray that you touch their lives in a mighty, mighty way. In Jesus' name, 